on Arthur Demridge from the Smithsonian Lemelson Center for the Study of Invention to introduce our keynote speaker. So good afternoon. Um, I want to start with three turning points. I come from a historical research institute. So some historical points that will help understand how fortunate we are to have Professor Horvitz here as a speaker. So about 100 years ago, the rediscovery of Gregor Mendel's fairly obscure research and publication on peas set forces in motion that would transform biology, turning it from observational to directly experimental and interventionist. Second, some 64 years ago, when our keynote speaker was about six years old, if I have this right, Watson and Crick elucidated the structure of DNA and, of course, shifted, as a result, medicine from what it had been to the study of the molecular level and molecular level interactions and a move again from observational to the interventional and experimental. And third, a couple speakers have referenced 1980 as a major turning point, thanks to the Bay-Dole Act. But there was also a Supreme Court ruling that patents on genetically modified organisms could be issued, as well, of course, as Genentech's IPO, the first biotechnology company becoming public and seeing a significant rise in its share value. And since then, we've seen a remarkable outpouring of innovative activity in universities, biotech companies, and some very interesting new hybrid organizations that have advanced medicine and pushed the boundaries of the underlying sciences. And today's distinguished keynote speaker has been at the forefront of these changes and is in fact leading the way forward. So it's a great privilege and high honor to introduce Professor Robert Horvitz. He's a professor of biology at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, an investigator of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. His research has helped define evolutionarily conserved molecular genetic pathways that are important in human biology and human disease, including, above others, the pathway responsible for programmed cell death, or apoptosis. He's a recipient of many honors and awards, including the 2002 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. He was elected a Fellow of the National Academy of Inventors in 2015. He holds numerous patents, has co-founded at least four biotechnology companies, and regularly advises pharmaceutical and venture capital companies. Um, among other things, I have to just toss in this note. He has this wonderful quote from Friedrich Nietzsche on his website, which is not every uh, molecular biologist has that. You've made your way from worm to man, and much within you is still worm. Today, he's offering us a random walk on biotech. So let me uh, start with a thank you. Thank you for that kind introduction. Uh, you did look at the website, interesting. Um, thank you uh, to you folks for being here. Uh, thank you to Paul Sandberg for in inviting me to give these uh, remarks today. I've very much appreciated uh, the prior talks this afternoon. I've, I've learned things and I think also some of what I say will resonate with uh, what we've already heard. Um, what I'm going to do this afternoon is basically describe my personal journey from being a, quote, pure academic scientist to becoming involved in the entrepreneurial world of biotechnology startups and the pharmaceutical and venture capital industries. And I'm going to illustrate my journey uh, both with examples of research from my academic lab and how some of this research uh, has related to and facilitated uh, the discovery and development of drugs and also tell you some stories from my own company involvements. And I, I hope that what I say uh, will be informative or if not informative, because I know we have a lot of experts here, possibly at least amusing in, in some ways. 
So let me start by saying that even becoming an academic uh, biologist was something I in no way anticipated when, when I was younger. I was an undergraduate at MIT. I received two undergraduate degrees. One was in mathematics, the other was in economics. I wrote my undergraduate thesis in the field of mathematical economics. The thesis was written with Bob Solo. Bob went on to win a Nobel Prize in economics that had absolutely nothing to do with my undergraduate thesis. I worked for four summers at IBM, and I expected that after graduating, I would continue working for IBM. Computers in the 1960s uh, looked promising. They also looked big and complicated. This was 7090 mainframe. Uh, your cell phone can perform calculations about 10 to the eighth times faster than this computer uh, did. Uh, but nonetheless, it was exciting times for, for computers, computation, and that seemed to be where I was going to go. When I wasn't thinking IBM, I was thinking maybe law school and a legal career, because I had been very involved in student government. Now, all of that began to change when I was a senior in college. As I entered my senior year, a roommate said to me, and a roommate who was a biology major uh, said to me, I should sign up for the introductory course in biology before it was too late, before I graduated, because as he told me, biology had gotten interesting. Um, so I signed up and I liked it. And six weeks into the beginning of my senior year in college, I went to the professor and I said, Professor Leventhal, I'm a senior majoring in math and economics. I like your biology course, and I'm thinking about going to graduate school in biology. Am I crazy? And Professor Leventhal looked at me and he said, my undergraduate degree was in physics, my PhD was in physics, and I'm teaching your biology course. You would be starting early. <laughs> okay, so that was good advice. and, and it, brings me to my first message of the day, and that is, don't be afraid to change and do something new. Okay? There's always something to do that may be different, and if it appeals, go for it. So I went to graduate school in biology. I had abso absolutely no idea what people were talking about for some time, but eventually I, I learned, I studied bacterial viruses, I spent six years in a cold room purifying enzymes, and I found that I loved doing experiments. And as much as doing experiments, I loved designing experiments, and I even loved designing techniques. And I found all of that to be great fun, which brings me to message two, have fun. As, as a good friend and, and colleague said to me many years ago, life is too short to do things that aren't fun. Have fun with, with what you do. So I was a graduate student uh, at Harvard, and I had incredibly good fortune to have as PhD advisors um, Jim Watson and Wally Gilbert. I actually had the privilege of having dinner with Wally last, last night. Um, Jim was a Nobel laureate, Wally was soon to become one, and again, this had absolutely nothing to do with me in any way, shape, or form. As I was finishing my PhD studies, Jim advised me to turn from bacterial viruses to animal viruses, which he believed to be the way of the, of the future, but I hesitated. And the reason I hesitated is that I had long been intrigued by the incredible capabilities of the human brain. And I wanted to at least think about studying neurobiology. Um, so Jim wisely asked me, did I know anything about neurobiology? And I had to quite honestly say, no, I, I did not. Jim then signed me up without my knowledge 
for three consecutive summer neurobiology courses at the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory on Long Island, where he had recently become the director. Um, I took the courses. I think I still hold the all-time Cold Spring Harbor record for consecutive courses in one summer. Um, and I began my transition from the field of gene expression into the field of neurobiology. And again, this echoes in a different way my first theme, which was don't be afraid to switch. Maybe a smaller switch, although some would say still a pretty substantial switch. And then I moved. I moved from Cambridge, across the river from here, to what some would call the real Cambridge uh, in England. And there I began studies of the nervous system of a microscopic worm. I worked with Sidney Brenner and John Sulston. Both Sidney and John later received Nobel Prizes, and in this time I actually had something to do with that, and I'll come back to that story in a few moments. After a few years in England, I returned to this Cambridge, and I became a faculty member in biology at MIT. And there I began my independent career as an academic scientist studying the biology of this worm. I was very lucky. I had spectacular young people working with me. And the science went very, very well. So how did I go from worms to biotech? The answer, in short, is in 1986, eight years after I joined the MIT faculty, um, I was invited to join the scientific advisory boards of two biotech startup companies, Cambridge Neuroscience, located here in Cambridge, Mass., and Athena Neurosciences in California. And soon thereafter, I was walking from MIT to the Mass General Hospital um, with a good friend, and I can call him a worm or wormy colleague, Jonathan Hodgkin, who went on to become the professor of genetics at Oxford. And I told Jonathan about these invitations, and I told him that, of course, I would be turning them down uh, because I was a scientist. I was a pure scientist, and that's what I was going to do, was my academic research. And Jonathan, who was and to this day still is as pure and academic as anyone I have ever known, stopped in mid-track, looked me straight in the eye, and said, don't you ever want to do anything useful? <laughs> so I thought about it, and I said yes. I said yes to Cambridge Neuroscience because I could walk there, whereas to go to San Francisco required something more than that. Uh, I have to say my entrepreneurial start financially would have been more worthwhile if I had gone with Athena, which did quite well. Uh, Cambridge Neuroscience did not do as well. Uh, but nonetheless, um, so be it. Okay, I, I did what I did. Uh, I have to say the next time I had a Massachusetts, California choice, given that I actually had believed that Athena looked more promising, I went with what was more promising despite the distance, and two things worked there. One is I did make a little bit more money, but secondly, I got an awful lot of frequent flyer miles. <laughs> that makes family happy as well, I should add. Um, so I didn't do Athena, but I still got a lot out of what I did do with Cambridge Neuroscience. And message three then, is learn from rather than regret past errors. There is something always to learn, and you can never look back. You just learn. So my first biotech experience was Cambridge Neuroscience, and what happened there, frankly, was I got hooked. I really loved thinking about how to apply discoveries in science, from science, from biology, to problems with medicine to how can you make a difference to patients? And we've heard a number of times this afternoon already, what really matters in the grand scheme of things? Okay, money is nice, it helps things, but if you can make a difference in the world, you're doing something much more valuable than that. And what has driven me from day one is the belief that I can do something in terms of making a difference to other people. 
And I've never looked back from that first experience. I have now uh, been involved in 14 biotech companies. I have uh, co-founded five. I worked for 14 years as a close advisor to a major pharmaceutical company, Novartis. And for the past nine years, I've chaired the medical and scientific advisory board of a major healthcare venture capital company, MPM Capital. And bottom line, all of it has been fun. So I titled today's remarks um, a random walk uh, into biotech, in part because of that random walk across the bridge from MIT to, to, to MGH so many years ago, because without it, I might well have never gotten involved in the world of startups, venture capital, and pharma. Okay, so now I want to back up a bit and fill in some of the gaps. Why were two biotech companies interested in an academic studying a microscopic worm? Uh, why do they want advice? How did I go from worms to drugs? And so I'm going to now tell you about worms. That's what I really know anyway. So you're going to hear about worms. Okay, and um, these are the worms. Cenorhabditis elegans, C. elegans for short. They're tiny, they're only a millimeter in length. And it was Sidney Brenner, uh, whom I introduced a little, a few moments ago, who introduced this animal to modern biological study. And John Sulston, whom I also introduced you to, uh, with a little help from his friends, myself included, uh, was very pivotal in the early studies of this animal. And in particular, what he determined, what John determined, was the complete pattern of cell divisions that allows this animal to go from a fertilized egg to adulthood. And that pattern of divisions is, is depicted in this cell lineage map. If you look at the top, you see, um, well, I don't know how to do this on both sides, you'll figure it out. Um, if you look at the top, you can see that uh, there, there is a single cell that divides. The line goes horizontally into two. Each of those divide into two and so on. Those are the sequential cell divisions that take the fertilized egg into uh, the adult animal. Okay? Um, this cell lineage diagram depicts the developmental origin of every cell in the animal, and it was our analysis of this cell lineage uh, that led to the discoveries in my lab of genes and genetic pathways that proved to be of interest to the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, these discoveries also took Sidney John and me uh, to Stockholm. So what did we find? And in short, what I'm going to tell you about today is the way in which we help solve two fundamental problems in biology. Cell signaling, how cells talk to each other, and as you heard earlier, uh, programmed cell death. So let me start with cell signaling. Um, the Nobel Committee described this work using a different phrase. They use the phrase organ development because it turns out when organs develop, develop, cells have to talk to each other. And the mechanisms by which cells talk to each other uh, are the ones that we really studied. And in fact, uh, the committee was, was trying not to embarrass itself or others by not describing in specific ways uh, the organ that we studied. Because what we studied was the development of the major female genitalia of this worm, the vulva. Okay? And if you look on the top there, the vulva is an opening that connects the inside of the gonad to the outside that lets, it lets eggs go from the inside to the outside for egg laying, lets males mate, and allows sperm to enter from the outside to the inside. Now the development of the vulva is induced by a signal from a nearby tissue, uh, the gonad. And in fact, a single cell in the gonad, a cell called the anchor cell, sends a signal that then is received, interpreted, and, and basically acted upon by three neighboring cells. And the molecular genetic pathway that is used by this worm in this signaling process turned out to be the same, in essence, as a key signaling pathway involved in human cancer. 
So let me explain that. The first human cancer gene, a gene known as RAS, R-A-S, was identified in 1981 by Ed Skolnick. Ed later became president of the Merck Research Labs. And for some years, biomedical researchers had been trying to figure out how RAS acted. What was the pathway? How did it get, a how did it get activated? What did it do? And the answer to that question turned out to emerge in part from studies of mammalian cells grown in culture in a dish, in part from studies of the eye of an insect, the fruit fly, Drosophila, and in part from our studies of the development of the worm vulva. And in a striking and, and to me breathtakingly rapid fashion, these three apparently independent lines of experimentation all came together and revealed the RAS pathway. Okay. The activation of this pathway can drive cancerous growth, and this pathway is probably the best studied signaling pathway in cancer biology. And importantly, components of this pathway are today targets for anti-cancer therapeutics. For example, if you see where that red X is, okay, that is uh, showing a protein that in humans we call EGFR, the EGF receptor. It's a kinase, and there are small molecule inhibitors of that kinase that prevent the action of that protein, and there are large macromolecule biologic inhibitors, antibodies, that can inhibit and otherwise affect the action of that, of that gene, of that protein. Okay. In addition, understanding this pathway has revealed why certain patients can become resistant to drugs like this. Okay? So that, for example, what you see here with the red box and triangle there, that RAS protein, if there's a mutation in a tumor that activates that protein so it no longer needs an upstream signal from the EGF receptor in friends, then if that mutation causes it to be active without an upstream signal, by blocking the upstream signal, you won't have any effect. A patient can become resistant. Similarly, if a patient has a mutation like that in RAS, that patient should never be treated with an upstream blocker anyway. It won't do any good. So by studying these basic fundamental biological problems, how the worm vulva develops, or how the fly eye develops, this information basically proved to be very helpful in thinking about diseases like cancers and, in fact, other disorders, and really helping to learn about how best to develop therapeutics. So I want to stress part of what I've just said. Certainly, fly eye and worm vulva were fundamental areas of research. When I began this research, neither, neither the generality nor the application of our efforts was in any way clear. The, the C. elegans was an obscure organism, even to biologists. Genetics was considered abstract. A lot of biologists didn't want to think about genetics at all. We didn't target any disease, and I didn't know if what we found would be relevant to any organism other than a microscopic worm that lives in the soil. Nonetheless, what we discovered were mechanisms that are universal amongst animals, including ourselves, and our findings help provide the basis for new treatments for a broad variety of diseases. So there's a very important message here, and it's an important message particularly today. Fundamental research, discovery-based research, will often lead not only to intellectually stimulating findings, and that's important, but also to findings that are of great practical impact. And so that is the next message. Basic research, fundamental research, is the driver of scientific knowledge. Now having said all of this, I was not involved entrepreneurially in commercializing any of that. We did it, other people took it, we didn't have patents that blocked them. They figured out what to do. It all went forward. Topic two, 
program cell death. Our studies of program cell death, again, studies that were absolutely basic research, um, did lead me to found a, a, a biotech company, and that biotech company was quite successful. So let me turn now from organ development to uh, program cell death. Program cell death refers to the, um, to, to the cell death that occurs as a normal aspect of the development of every animal that's been studied. So, for example, when a tadpole loses its tail, undergoing metamorphosis to become a frog, there are cells in the tail, they die, that's programmed cell death. If you look at a human fetus developing in utero, there is webbed region regions between the digits, the fingers and the toes. These web regions have cells, these cells die. That is programmed cell death. If you consider the development of the mammalian brain, at certain times in certain places, it's made as many as 85% of the nerve cells undergo programmed cell death. As we sit here today in our blood, there are blood cells of a certain type, thymocytes, as many as 95% of those cells that are being generated die by program cell death. Despite the pervasive nature of program cell death in biology, until not very many years ago, um, biologists, when they thought about program cell death, and I should probably say if they thought about program cell death, um, basically thought wasn't interesting because cells died because they were unhappy, they had been mistreated, something was wrong. And what we know today is that that's not the case. There, it can be an active process on the part of cells that die to make those cells die. There are genes that have to act in cells that are gonna die to cause those cells to die. There is a biology of cell death every bit as much as there is a biology of other fundamental biological processes like cell division, like cell migration, uh, like cell differentiation. And not surprisingly, where there is a biology, there is a pathology. If cell death goes wrong in us, disease can result. And there are actually a great number of human disorders, which are disorders and abnormalities of cell death. And they come in two varieties, too much or too little. Too much cell death, neurodegenerative disorders, Alzheimer's, Huntington's, Parkinson's, ALS, uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, are neurodegenerative disorders in which certain kinds of nerve cells die. And at least some of these disorders are actually disorders in which that normal mechanism of programmed cell death is unleashed when it shouldn't be, in cell types it shouldn't be. So certain retinal degenerations are unquestionably of this sort. On the other hand, there are disorders in which there's too little cell death. I mentioned those thymocytes in the blood. Well, why are 95% of the thymocytes killed? Why do they die? And the answer is, if they didn't, some of those blood cells would recognize your body from within and attack, and that would result in autoimmune disease. And autoimmune disease can result when there is too little cell death. Cancer. People think about cancer generally as cell division gone wild. Cells divide and divide and divide, and that's true, but it's only half the story. Because many of the tissues in our bodies, the number of cells is defined by an equilibrium between the processes of cell addition and cell depletion. And just as too much cell addition can lead to cancerous growth, so can too little cell depletion. And it looks like probably all cancers involve both too much cell division and too little cell death. And some cancers, like follicular lymphoma pictured on this slide, are fundamentally cancers in which there are, is too little cell death. So we decided to study this problem and we took advantage of our knowledge of the cell lineage because this cell lineage generates the 959 cells found in the adult worm. This is a very low number, the animal is very simple. But it also generates 131 cells that are not found in the adult worm because those cells undergo programmed cell death. 
So what we did was seek genes that are involved in this process by looking for mutant worms in which there was too, mu too much or too little cell death. And these studies defined a four-step genetic pathway for cell death. Every cell has to decide, I will live or I will die by programmed cell death. If it decides to die, it has to literally execute that decision and become dead after which a neighboring cell comes in and swallows it, followed by a process of degradation of the cellular debris. So that's the basic genetic pathway for programmed cell death. And to put that in, in perhaps simpler, less abstract terms, uh, you can look at these steps as indicated here. Okay, so what I'm going to focus on now is step two, kill. And our studies identified a four-gene molecular genetic pathway that is involved in killing. And it turned out these genes have human counterparts. The human counterparts work in much the same way. And the way to think about this is starting at the right end. I know that's backwards for most English-speaking people. Um, starting at the right end, the gene said three is a killer. The gene said four kills by activating said three. The gene said nine is a protector. It protects against programmed cell death, and it does that by preventing said four from activating said three. And EGL1 is another killer, and it kills by preventing said nine from preventing said four from activating said three. Again, human counterparts shown below, and these counterparts are interesting. For example, SED9 has as its first identified counterpart a gene called BCL2. BCL stands for B-cell lymphoma. That's a human cancer gene. Turns out that gene protects against programmed cell death. It's the gene involved in follicular lymphoma that I described before. The human BCL2 gene, if it's put into C. elegans, protects against cell death. Furthermore, if it's put into a C. elegans mutant that lacks SED9, it substitutes for SED9. These were the kinds of studies that said not only do these genes look similar in, in DNA sequence and protein sequence, uh, and not only do they both affect programmed cell death, but in fact the pathways have to be much the same if the human gene is going to work in a worm. Similar studies for the gene SED3. SED3, the first counterpart for SED3 was a human gene called ICE, interleukin-1 beta-converting enzyme, identified by a pharmaceutical company interested in human inflammatory disease. SED3, the worm gene put into a mammalian cell, causes the cell to undergo programmed cell death. Okay. SED3 and ICE are the founding members of a family of proteases, proteins that chop up, eat up other proteins uh, that are today known as caspases. And today we know that caspases drive programmed cell death in all organisms, including us. OK, so the evolu evolutionary conservation here um, drove me to start a biotech company founded around the biology of programmed cell death. The company is, uh, was called Iden Pharmaceuticals, and the rationale of Iden was the following. We could develop compounds to interface in either direction, to either block programmed cell death and therefore rescue cells that were dying in diseases in which there was too much programmed cell death, or to block protectors of programmed cell death, activating cell death, to be used for treatment of diseases in which there, in fact, was too little cell death. So we developed both programs, and I just want to give a quick update. Um, oops, that's, here's BCL2, uh, the protector. Cancer disorder in which there is too little cell death blocked BCL2, human gene that protects against cell death, activates cell death. IDEN had a program. It was collaborative with Abbott Labs. Abbott became AbbVie. AbbVie partnered with Genentech. 
And almost one year ago to the day, the FDA approved this drug for treatment of human cancer, in particular the cancer chronic lymphocytic leukemia, CLL. That's a drug now on the market treating and curing patients, and I'm told by oncologist friends that it's a good drug. You may ask what's good and what's bad about drugs. That's another story. Next, caspases. Caspases kill. Block caspases, you prevent the death. A lot of disorders, too much death. We develop compounds. The compounds went to the liver. That's not surprising. You put most compounds into a mammal, they'll go to the liver. We said that's an opportunity. We defined liver indications, which had involved too much cell death, and developed compounds for that purpose. Iden was bought by Pfizer. Pfizer spun it out to a biotech called Canatis. There are now a number of liver programs for caspase inhibition and phase two clinical trials uh, for uh, liver disorders with these caspase inhibitors. Okay, now Iden no longer exists. I'm no longer involved in any of these efforts. I don't have a financial interest at all in any of this, uh, but I remain excited because I think it's making a difference. And again, I think that's what matters. Now, my involvement with IDEN was very important to me along my entrepreneurial uh, journey. Not only did it lead to a drug that actually is FDA approved and, and working, um, but I learned a lot of things. One of the things I learned is that medicinal chemists are magicians. Okay. They can tweak an atom here and tweak an atom there, and suddenly they take something useless and make a drug. And, and my experience from that uh, is a very simple message. Oh, be opportunistic, this was liver. We did liver because it went to liver. Be opportunistic, another message. Next message, pros help. Sometimes you really need people with professional knowledge to do what you want to do. Don't kid yourself. Um, more generally with Iden, I, I had the privilege of working with exceptional people. A team there, the co-founders, uh, the pharma partners, and in particular, the board of directors. I learned an enormous amount from the Iden board. And I learned about this interface that includes science, medicine, and finance. And putting it all together, uh, I ended up with a message that we've already heard today. It's all about the people. As, as one of the Iden investors told me at the time, if you have a great concept and the wrong people, they will ruin it. If you have the right people and any concept, they will figure out what to do. And, and I think I really, I really do believe that. So message, surround yourself with great people. I want to mention one other learning from my Iden days. I co-founded Iden with serial uh, biotech entrepreneur Larry Fritz, who previously actually had been a co-founder of Athena Neurosciences. I picked up Larry second time around there. Um, Larry built Iden from day one, literally from the cardboard box stage. He assembled the team, he defined the programs, he, he drove the venture investments, he drove the farmer partnerships. To me, Larry was Iden, Iden was Larry. No separation of the two. Um, as Iden was growing the board, and I was involved, hired a CEO. And the CEO fired Larry. I was devastated. I was depressed beyond words. I didn't expect it. I didn't know what to do, and I was really worried about Larry. And I called him up, and I found Larry was fine. In fact, he was kind of upbeat. And I said, Larry, what, what, what's going on? And Larry said, oh, this is the business. He said, people come, people go. Now I'm going to find something else to do. This is an opportunity. I'm excited. And I thought, that's interesting. So my next learning was entrepreneurs have to be resilient. Failure is a corollary of risk taking. Again, something we've already heard. And I might also add that, that watching Larry go through this and, and learning this fact uh, might well be why I've maintained my day job as an academic, because I don't think I quite have the resilience that I, that I saw in, in Larry. 
Okay, so from Iden, I've gone on to many other commercial involvements. Uh, I joined and soon thereafter was given the privilege of chairing uh, the Medical and Scientific Advisory Board of MPM Capital. Um, MPM was eye-opening to me in many ways. I had been involved in biotech. I had asked many venture capital funding uh, companies for funds, but I had never sat on the other side of the table and seen what makes a venture capital company want to fund uh, a, a startup. And so I learned a lot about that. I also learned from the Monday portfolio reviews um, how a really good group uh, runs meetings. If someone spoke, um, he or she actually had something to say. Uh, and it was crisp, it was succinct, it was knowledgeable, it was deep, and most importantly, everybody listened. And, and a message from there is listen. You know, if you have smart people around you, you should listen to them. Don't just do your own talking, listen to them and, and learn from them. Now, more generally, uh, I've really learned a lot about these, again, interconnected worlds of, of biomedicine and finance. And I've also had the privilege of co-founding two more MPM finance companies uh, in, in this role. One of them is Epizyme. Epizyme has harnessed the uh, emerging biology of epigenetics. It's now a public company. It has uh, three, um, three drugs in clinical trials. It has a market cap of almost a billion dollars. And so it's doing well. I think it's actually going to cure people. Second MPM company, Mitobridge, has harnessed a second emerging, uh, emerging biology the biology of mitochondria, which are key organelles in every cell. Uh, Mitobridge is, is privately held, and it's progressed at an amazing rate. Uh, it's driven by a, a very innovative team. Uh, they're pictured. Uh, here's Mitobridge. Here's the Mitobridge team on a, a typical day. Um, great group of people. Um, I've also worked closely both as SAB chair and board observer with a biotech company with a different business model. We heard a mention of Bob Langer a moment ago. Bob is a colleague, close friend, and a colleague with respect to this company. This company is called PureTech. And PureTech starts companies in a different way. It basically likes to put people in a room who have never seen each other before and get them to think and just be creative and, and, and try to blue sky around areas and come up with ideas that most people in, in this industry uh, would never touch and then try to professionally evaluate uh, whether they ought to be touched. And from PureTech, I've really seen ways that pioneers can be truly innovative. And I'll give you a flavor of some of the pi uh, pioneering pure tech concept companies, uh, the first of which actually comes out of Bob Langer's uh, lab and probably brain. It's a, it's a company called Gelesis, and Gelesis is a company that's developing a treatment for obesity and diabetes based on a polymer that you swallow and it swells and it curbs appetite. Okay, completely different from what most companies are doing. A second pure tech company I'll mention is Karuna. It's developing a treatment for schizophrenia that's combining two drugs, something that most drug companies don't, don't like doing. One is a clinically tested compound that's shown efficacy in schizophrenia and some efficacy even in Alzheimer's, uh, but has bad toxicity outside the nervous system. And the second compound is an FDA-approved compound that blocks the action of the first compound, but only outside the nervous system. And putting the two together, you eliminate the tox outside the nervous system and you still have efficacy inside. Okay, that's, that's where that's going. A third pure tech company called Sond is uh, developing a novel technology for use with cell phones that can detect subtle changes in voice and is being developed for a variety of health indications. And, and a fourth uh, of the uh, pure tech companies that I'll mention is called Achille. And this is a computer game that we hope to get FDA approved for disorders like ADD. Okay, so just again, unusual people 
unusual I ideas. And I want to note that with the many companies I've interacted with, they've had very different business models, sources of financing, and trajectories. So Cambridge Neuroscience, all the money came from one venture fund. Um, Nemefarm was from friends and SBIRs and, and other grants. Iden was financed with a small seed from a small venture fund, uh, which then we built into a, a much more uh, substantial Series A. Mitobridge was funded entirely by one venture company in collaboration with a pharmaceutical company from day one. We've never had to raise another penny from the day we founded that company. And the exits also vary. There are IPOs. Uh, there is acquisition by a large pharma. There's what I would call serial acquisition, where a small biotech was acquired by a less small biotech, acquired by an even less small biotech, acquired by a moderate-sized biotech. Okay? All of these lead, lead to different kinds of exits, different kinds of liquidity. And the message here is one size doesn't fit all. There are many ways to start, many ways to succeed. Again, a theme that we've heard uh, earlier today. So I want to turn at this point to just one final topic. And that's a topic that may seem a little strange to talk about. It's consulting agreements. Um, when consulting with a company, whether you're a founder or just giving advice in some other way, I think it's actually quite important for both sides to have a written agreement in place. And over the years, I've negotiated and signed many such agreements, and much to my surprise, I ended up writing an article about this. I even ended up writing a book about this. And, and this came about because I am an investigator of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, and HHMI has, like many universities, but perhaps even more so, oversight over what I can and cannot sign on to do. And so every time I did some consulting, I needed approval from HHMI. My HHMI lawyer was a guy named Ed Cleese, and one day Ed called me up, and he said, you know, Bob, I keep getting all these HHMI investigators I have to talk to, and they always ask me the same things, and I just tell them over and over again. And I said, well, I was sympathetic because, you know, I've started a number of companies, I've worked with more, and my academic friends, when they're starting things, they always come to me. And Ed said, good, I want to write an article with you about consulting agreements. And I said, thank you, no. <laughs> Ed said, please. I said, no. This went on. I said, yes. Um, so eventually we wrote an article. Uh, actually, the title in the context of this afternoon will look somewhat familiar. It was called Consulting Agreements, the Good, B the Bad, and the Ugly. And what was clear was that this article only skimmed the surface. Um, and it became a book. Okay. So how can consulting agreements be a book? Well, I should say, first of all, the book contains advice that was primarily directed to academics in the field of biomedicine, but most of the advice is generic. I think it applies to anybody who's interested in, in consulting. And the advice is very straightforward. You know, it says things like, you know, if you're going to sign something, read it and understand it. Um, it says, if you read something you don't like, before you sign it, try to get it changed. And, and it says, other things um, to think about. So if you're starting a company and, and you're going to have a substantial amount of equity, you know, maybe it's worth thinking about being tax efficient in terms of your kids and, and putting some of your founder stock, stock into a trust. So it, it has simple, straightforward things like this. That still all fits in an article. How did it get to be a book? Well, it gets to be a book because there are actually an enormous number of ways to go wrong. We've heard some of them touched upon today, but there, there are many more. I'll give you a couple of examples. So let's say you hold 1% of a company, and the company is sold for $110 million. Okay. So 1%, $110 million, you do the calculation, you're sitting there waiting for your $1.1 million check, and you get the check in the mail, and it's $100,000. And you say, this must be a mistake, and the answer is no, it's not. 
Well, why isn't it? Well, it turns out that what you weren't paying attention to was the fact that while you held common stock, the investors held participating preferred with a 2x liquidation preference. And you kind of saw that, but you had no idea what it meant. And it meant a million dollars or a factor of uh, 10. Um, so, you know, that, that's, a, that's an issue. Um, second example, you hold stock options in, in a startup. And the company does great. It goes public. And it has a phenomenally high valuation. And you exercise your options. Um, and and you, you, you hold the stock. And the company falls apart. Okay? And the stock's worth nothing. And does that mean easy come, easy, no, easy go? And the answer is no. And the reason is three letters, IRS. You owe tax on the gain you had when you exercised your options. And you can end up owing a lot more than your net worth. Well, this is something abstract, but it's actually something real. So I had a colleague who exercised options. The gain was $20 million. Okay. Had he stole, sold his stock immediately, he would have had a gain of about $10 million. Instead, he held the stock. Not only that, he was so optimistic, he actually bought more stock in the open market. Okay. The company's valuation dropped precipitously. And in essence, what happened was instead of making $10 million, he made zero. And he was lucky because he could sell enough stock to pay the IRS. He didn't have to to get rid of everything else. OK, so these are just the kinds of things that one wants to be aware of. But there are many other things. You know, uh, details about Title 26, the IRS tax code. OK, I learned very early on about Section 83B, but only somewhat later about Section 1202. Uh, they both can make a big difference. So in short, from this and many other things, the message is, you know, pay attention. Details can really make a difference. OK, so with that, what I really want to say is to end with the same two words I started with. The two words are thank you. I say thank you to the many colleagues and friends who have guided me through life, who have guided me through my entrepreneurial life. I say thank you to you for, for persevering here, here today uh, and listening. Uh, I, I must say I have learned so much in, in my adventure uh, that, that I've told you a little bit about. And all in all, I, I want to end with, with what I, I, I think in the grand scheme of things, in addition to doing good, you know, one thing to always keep in mind is have fun. I've had enormous fun as an academic entrepreneur. And I hope that whatever your vantage point on the world of entrepreneurs and innovators is, uh, that you too have fun going forward because it really is what matters. And I thank you very much. Thank you.